So NOAA scientist Chris Elridge um, is quoted as saying that nothing shows the impacts of humans on the planet like city lights. And we've already seen some similar uses of data like this, but um, we're entering a new age, the, the Anthropocene, a new geological epoch that's distinct from the previous Holocene based on our impacts. In this really simplistic depiction of the land's surface area, um, you can see that 40% of the land surface across the world is used for agriculture. When we consider urban activities, uh, infrastructure, power lines, all sorts of things, um, you find that the remaining space is quite small and there's a lot of competition for what we use the remaining space for. And there, this results in conflict. So uh, I these elephants are crop raiding, if you like, in a tea plantation that someone is losing money from. Uh, and every year in India, uh, 100 uh, individual humans and 40 to 50 elephants are killed through conflict around crop raiding because their needs are overlapping spatially. When we think about biodiversity <laughs> loss, which is currently 1,000 to 10,000 times the natural rate, extinction rates are, are, are very high, we often think of um, habitat clearance and indeed it is one of the highest drivers of, of biodiversity loss. And palm oil is a, is a big, um, getting a lot of media attention at the moment where you have these, me these monocultures um, taking over landscapes. But actually it's not just places like Indonesia and, and tropical rainforests that we need to be worried about. In 2013, a uh, change of government policy in Queensland tripled the rate of habitat clearance. And this diagram only shows those habitats that were for threatened species um, that were cleared in this time period. Um, so it's really pertinent that we pay a lot of attention to the impacts. In this diagram, the green circle um, represents what's called a safe operating space for humanity, where our impacts on natural processes are sustainable. We know that climate change at the top is, is definitely beyond that. The nitrogen cycling is a, is a problem as well, but biodiversity loss and the rate of biodiversity loss is off the charts. And we don't talk about that a lot. But it's hard to visualise what, what biodiversity loss actually means. In this art exhibition at Cambridge at the moment, um, you can liken the name of 4,000 critically endangered species to a preemptive memorial wall. And when you think about um, memorial walls for fallen soldiers at the Cenotaph and otherwise, they're only individuals on the walls, and that's not to underestimate the importance of it, but these are, th these are individual species, thousands of um, animals and plants. But it's not just about species, warm and fuzzy or otherwise, it's actually about functioning ecosystems that we depend on for our clean air, clean water, healthy soils. And together all these components that we often take for granted are incredibly important financially and otherwise. One way to protect them and to avoid habitat loss is through the creation and designation of protected area networks. Um, currently the Earth's uh, across the land surface area, 12 to 15 percent of the land surface is in protected areas and 4 to 6 percent of the oceans and coastal areas. <coughs> but we've signed up to uh, a commitment through the Convention on Biological Diversity to increase those percentages to 17% of the land area and 10% of the oceans by 2020. That's not very far away, so we need to make some really strategic decisions so that we're, we're including additional areas that are best for biodiversity. There are a lot of good news stories. I don't want to be just saying that everything's, everything's coming apart. Just a, a week or two ago, the Ecuadorian government announced a new extension to a no-take, no-fishing marine zone off the Galapagos Islands, a really important biodiversity hotspot. And regardless of what you think about sharks personally, um, they're incredibly important and very threatened um, group of animals. Protected areas are not static, however, uh, and we go back to history and we look at this and we understand that all the countries um, in orange have actually either removed protected area status for areas or reduced um, the rigour of that protection perhaps by allowing um, economic activities that might be a bit disruptive into those um, areas. <coughs> So we need to, the status quo is not, is not acceptable, uh, we need to think of a new vision and it can be quite a positive vision but it needs to be creative and inclusive, all the different people, not just ecologists such as myself, need to be thinking about what we want the future of our planet to look like. Um, I don't fancy living on Mars but you know some other people might, might disagree. Um, there are a range of tools available for us to do this, um, trade-offs between different habitat types, different economic uses looking at cost benefits but also different types of quality of environmental habitats are available and I actually study something called systematic conservation planning which is a novel scenario analysis <coughs> approach. Uh, other people have put out quite um, dramatic manifestos and visions for the future. This one proposes that with, an, with a, um, an additional 2 billion people by 2020 we should be thinking about intensifying and getting people in urban areas, intensifying agriculture to increase agricultural yield 
but also intensifying um, the wilderness of wilderness areas so that they remain. Ideas like that um, but fly in the face of other opinions which suggest that humans and their natural world are not separate, are not, are not suitable to be separated out and actually need to be integrated. And there could be a lot of perverse outcomes of actually separating people from nature and, and pot potential disconnect problems. Another academic discussion at the moment, but still um, of interest, is um, the land sharing versus land sparing debate whereby you conduct agriculture within a natural environment or you separate them out and, and can work out the relative um, yield for agriculture but also the relative benefit for any, a sort of a fragmented or a, or a large segment of biodiversity. There are lots of different visions and there isn't one single vision for Australia or for the world or, or anywhere else. We need to be thinking quite creatively. But on the left, um, we've got some land sharing scenarios, Paris and Japan at the top. Um, and on the right, we've got some land sparing um, scenarios to give you a bit of an idea of what landscapes might look like if we start to really engineer what we want to get out of them. Ultimately, uh, this is a human problem. We are entering this Anthropocene. Um, and it's up to us to set the agenda. We, 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 want to, to, um, we can't just sit back and let it happen. Let's positively think about what futures are possible and what trade-offs and, and comparisons we're prepared to put up with. Um, we've got a lot of really fantastic uh, work that's coming out of Australia and elsewhere, um, and a lot of planning documents, a lot of information. I think the challenge now is to actually make sure that's integrated preemptively rather than um, after the damage has been done into our planning, so into our infrastructure planning, into our, uh, our cities, into our financial systems. So we're planning for um, a natural world that we, we would like to live in um, before it's a bit too late. So leadership in Australia uh, is actually really strong in this area. Um, unlike a lot of places in Europe, there hasn't been the same level of development across the country and we do have a lot of beautiful areas and a really strong academic conservation community. I think the areas that we can really we can really improve on are integrating with other with other groups and actually sometimes that conversation to understand what other values for those areas are, not just assuming that a protected area should be there because we value that species. Um, it may not be very effective if that has adverse impacts on our local community. I mean, in terms of spatial planning, we have a lot of space, but we don't have a large amount of fertile soils. For example, 56% um, of Australia is covered by grazing which seems remarkable when you think of how much is desert. So it, we do need to have those discussions. It's as important in Australia as, as anywhere else. Thank you.